parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, uh, I, I suppose this would be one of the most uh, well-known parables in Scripture, not only, of course, amongst Bible students, but even amongst nominal Christians in the world, community groups and so forth. Uh, there are groups called the Samaritans, which are devoted to helping people who've you know, fallen on hard times or become less fortunate. So everybody would be familiar, whether they believe us or not, with the parable of the Good Samaritan. Generally speaking, as far as the Christian world is concerned, I think the uh, interpretation of this parable would be that uh, if you do good to everybody, you'll get eternal life, or you'll go to heaven when you die, or something of that nature. Well, in fact, doing good to others would be an interpretation of this parable, but a minor interpretation, not the major interpretation at all. As we see, as we begin to read it and understand it, the Lord's got an entirely different meaning that he puts on all of these words. So what's happening? Well, the story begins, as you can see, in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. And it says there that, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted the Lord, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this isn't the only time a lawyer has asked the Lord a question. And it's certainly not the only time a lawyer has asked the Lord a question, tempting him. You might recall the three great, great questions that came to the Lord in Matthew chapter 22, a Pharisee. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? A Sadducee. A woman's got seven husbands. Who's she married to in the resurrection? And then a lawyer. Matthew 22, verse 35, a lawyer, it says, tempting him. What's the greatest commandment of the law? To which Jesus, you will remember, replies, there are two equally great commandments. Love God, love your neighbor, which, by the way, is exactly the answer that this lawyer gives in verse 27 of Luke chapter 10. So let me be clear. This is not the parallel record to Matthew 22. This is a different occasion at a different time. Yet it's two lawyers between Luke 10 and, and Matthew 22, two lawyers asking the Lord the same question and whether he gives it or they give it. It's the same answer. Love God, love your neighbor. We're going to see in a moment that this lawyer is, in fact, a very astute man, because the answer he gives in verse 27 is exactly the right answer. We know that because it's the same answer that Jesus himself gave in Matthew 22 when the same question came up. But before I get to that, let's talk about lawyers. This man's a lawyer, it says in verse 25. Now, what, what does that mean? Well, the lawyers were the scribes. That's who the lawyers were. Originally, the scribes were copyists and expositors. But of course, as time went by, because of their knowledge of the law, they began to be called upon to judge in legal matters. And it became their forte. It became their job to quote a tradition or to give an example or to make a deduction for every case that came to the Jewish courts of law. And they were called upon because of their legal experience because of the time they spent copying and therefore reading the law. Well, of course, when the Lord came on the scene, the scribes had a lot to lose. Because of their expertise, they did most of the speaking in the synagogues. But you recall the remarkable words of Mark 1 and verse 22. When Christ spoke at Capernaum, the people were astonished because he spoke with authority and not as the scribes. He didn't speak like one of the lawyers. And so the difference between the Lord's approach and their approach was very, very clear, at least in Mark 1 and verse 22. But there's something else the scribes would do. If you turn one page back to Luke 9 and verse 22, you read this. Jesus said that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes, and be slain and raised the third day. So when the Lord himself would be taken before the Sanhedrin in the Jewish law courts at the end, they'd be there. They'd be there. And it would be the lawyers, the interpreters, the judges, whose expertise would be called upon to secure a guilty verdict. So you see, right at the outset 
when this lawyer confronts the Lord Jesus Christ, the battle lines are drawn. There's nothing benign about this conversation. This is not just a genuine lawyer coming to the Lord with a genuine question. He represented a fraternity which hated everything the Lord Jesus Christ stood for. Everything's at stake, you see, in this conversation. You want to see that? Look at verse 25 again. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up. Stop. Why did he stand up? Why did he need to stand up? Well, I suppose there was a group of people sitting there at, at Jesus' feet, as was their custom. He was there amongst them, and he's got a question. Well, he didn't have to stand to ask the question, but he chooses to stand. Why does he choose to stand? Well, because, you see, court's in session, isn't it? He's a lawyer. Court's in session. And he's going to take the Lord on. Well, what's the question? Verse 25, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that's an interesting question because, of course, this man is a Judaizer. What must I do, he says. You see, he believes in a doctrine of salvation by works, that by doing things, he can earn salvation. How can I inherit eternal life? As if by his actions, he can make it a certainty. By his actions, he can put God in his debt and get something. See, his whole life's been devoted to a minute interpretation of the law, so he can no longer see principles behind commandments. He's a very transactional man. Well, Jesus answers him in verse 26. Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? You're a Bible student. What does your Bible study tell you? And back comes the answer in verse 27. He, that is the lawyer, answering said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor is thyself. And this is a brilliant answer. Because in this answer in verse 27, he's combined together two Old Testament quotations. And if you've got an Oxford Bible, both of them are in your center margin. He's stitched together Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, love God, and Leviticus 19, verse 18, love your neighbor. They're exactly the same two quotations the Lord Jesus Christ used in Matthew 22 when he was asked the same question. So it's the perfect answer, you see. Now, the first of these two quotations, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, there was, there was really nothing special about that as far as the lawyers were concerned. Because in Deuteronomy 6, verse 8, the record, speaking of the commandments, the record says that thou shalt bind them as a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Now, the meaning of that was that the love of God should guide everything we do. It should go before us. But the lawyers were legalists. And so what they did was, when the law said in Deuteronomy 6, verse 8, bind, it, bind the commandment between your eyes, they wrote the commandment on a piece of paper, they put it in a little matchbox, and they strapped it to their foreheads. They called it a phylactery. So the point is, Every lawyer knew Deuteronomy chapter 6. There was nothing special for him to quote that. The brilliance of this lawyer was in linking Deuteronomy chapter 6 to Leviticus chapter 19. Because as I say, when Jesus was asked the same question, he did exactly the same thing in Matthew 22. Jesus then said that the reason he linked those two quotations together in Matthew 22 was because upon those two quotations hang all the law and the prophets. And the astuteness of this lawyer was such that he understood that too. Now, how do all the law and the prophets rest upon those two quotations? Well, you think about it like this, the Ten Commandments. What are the Ten Commandments? Have no other gods before me. Have no idols. Don't take the name of thy God in vain. So don't blaspheme and keep the Sabbath. Four commandments speaking to your love of God. Followed by honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness and don't covet. 
six commandments relating to your love for your neighbor. OK, <laughs> love God, love your neighbor. Deuteronomy 6, Leviticus 19. Upon those two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And if the Ten Commandments are a summary of the law of the prophets, the first four are about love God and the last six are about love your neighbor. That was the brilliance of the lawyer in stitching those two things together. But the Apostle Paul makes a similar point in Romans 13 verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. So that was it. Love God, love your neighbor. The whole law is based upon those two things. So the answer is excellent that this lawyer gives. And Jesus returns the favor in verse 28. Jesus said to him, thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. And that itself, as your margin will tell you, is a quotation from Leviticus 18 and verse 5. So the, the, Lord, mat the Lord matches him, quote for quote, and says, 10 out of 10. You shall therefore keep my statutes, says Leviticus 18 and verse 5, which if a man do, he shall live in them. Excellent answer. Excellent answer. But here's the point. The lawyer didn't need to stand up to ask that question. This was a well-known question. And this lawyer already knows the answer because he's just given it in verse 27. What's going on? Well, what's going on is that that's not the real question. You know what lawyers are like. This was just the introduction. I have a supplementary question, Your Honor. And here it comes. Verse 29. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Oh, oh, oh. And just who? is my neighbor? And there's the question. There's the real question. And Jesus would straighten up and he'd meet this question eye to eye. In fact, you'll notice in verse 27, the lawyer, speaking of the lawyer, it says he answering said, love God, love your neighbor. In verse 30, it says that Jesus answering the lawyer said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. The two words answering in verse 27 and verse 30 are different words. In verse 27, when it says that the lawyer answered Jesus, the word simply means to respond. Like it means to answer. In verse 30, when Jesus answered, the word means to take up a challenge. It doesn't just mean respond. It means to meet a challenge. And the problem here, you see, is that this lawyer thinks he's in court. His problem is that he's now going to argue the toss on the meaning of a word. He wants a, a precise definition of who his neighbor is, on, that is, on who he should love. But he's gone to court to argue about the meaning of a word with a man who's the word made flesh. This is not going to end well, as you'll appreciate because this lawyer, you see, has a very, very specific definition of who his neighbor is. And therefore, he wants a very restrictive application of love. Now, we know that because Jesus said previously in Matthew 5 and verse 43, you've heard that's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Well, here's the problem. Leviticus 19 never said anything about hating your enemy. Leviticus 19 says, love your neighbor. It never says, hate your enemy. Well, what did Jesus mean there when he says in Matthew 5, you've heard that it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. Who said, hate your enemy? Well, the answer is, the lawyers said that. The lawyers all said, hate your enemy. Well, that begs the question. Who does this lawyer think his neighbor is in verse 29? He's asked Jesus. <coughs> Who does the lawyer think the neighbor is? Well, obviously, only Jews. And then only some Jews, probably only Jews like him, maybe Pharisees, maybe Sadducees, but certainly not publicans and sinners. Well, out it comes. And here's the, let me, here's the story. <clears throat> 
Jesus answered and said in verse 30, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. A certain man went down, the record says. So we're going from Jerusalem, you can see on the left-hand side of that picture, down to Jericho in the Jordan Valley. And literally, if you travel from Jerusalem to Jericho, you do go down vertically about 4,000 feet across a distance of about 21 miles. <coughs> and this road from Jerusalem to Jericho had a name. It had a special name. In Joshua 15 and verse 7, this road is called the Ascent of Adamim. Adamim, that is the word Adam, and it's a plural, Adamim, the Ascent of Adamim, or the Ascent of Reds, the color red, because of course Adam means red. And it's a reference to the red rocks on the pass as you descend from Jerusalem to Jericho. But of course, in the Lord's day, this road had become notorious as the hideout of thieves and robbers. So it was actually an extremely dangerous road. And so the name had been modified. It wasn't called anymore the Ascent of Reds. The locals called it the Ascent of Blood. And you can see the link. Blood, of course, is red, except that the point was, if you ever went up this road alone, it would likely be your last journey. It was the ascent of blood, not just the ascent of reds. Not only that, but this man is journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho. So he's going downhill, but he's going down in more ways than one, because, of course, Jerusalem means the city of peace. In contrast, Jericho was the city of a curse. In fact, the city of two curses. Because in Joshua 6 and verse 26, we're told that anybody who wants to rebuild Jericho will set up the walls with the life of his eldest son and complete the gates with the life of his youngest. It will cost you two children if you ever want to build Jericho. The city of two curses, you see. So in a very literal sense, He's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho in a moral sense, you might say. He's also declining from Jerusalem to Jericho. Well, sadly, he fell among thieves, verse 30 says. And in this case, it's obvious the thieves were desperate because the chap had no money. And so they stole his clothes. They stole his clothes and they beat him almost to death. And there's a point here. In uh, Exodus 22 in verse 26, it tells us that if a man falls into debt and he owes you money and you take security from him to ensure he pays you, and if the security you take is his raiment, his outer coat, you've got to give him that coat back before sundown. You can take it again the next day, but you've got to give it back before sundown because he won't survive the night without his coat. If you don't give it back and he cries to me, says God, I'll hear him and I'll deal with you. Well, here's a man who's half dead. He's lost his coat. He won't survive the night. He's got no hope unless someone helps him. Well, someone comes. And in verse 31, it tells us that by chance there came down a certain priest by that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side by chance. You know what? There's no chance in this at all. It wasn't an issue of chance. Jericho, you see, was the priestly city. That is to say, the priests lived there. According to Luke chapter 1, the priests ministered in their courses each year. And when they weren't on, uh, on duty in the temple in Jerusalem, historians tell us they lived in Jericho. Jericho is a very favorable city to live in. A very pleasant climate in Jericho. What that means is that when this priest is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho in verse 31, he has just finished his week of temple service and he's going home at the end of the week. But he's got a problem because Leviticus 21 verse 1 says, speak to the priest, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, there shall none be defiled for the dead among his people. Priests can't come near dead people. 
Numbers 19, verse 11. He that toucheth a dead body should be unclean seven days. Even the proximity of a dead body would defile you. In Numbers 19 and verse 14, when a man dies in a tent, all that come into the tent will be unclean seven days. The point is that the priest could not help dead or dying people. They couldn't have contact with them. It was illegal. He can't help. He passed by on the other side in verse 31. Well, here's the next one, verse 32. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. So here's a Levite. Now, he's one step more interested than the priest. The priest just walked away. The Levite, in verse 32, he came and he looked at him. So he got close. <coughs> he's interested. But what's going through his mind? Perhaps he thought of Deuteronomy 22, verse 1. If your brother's ox or ass go astray and you see it, bring it to your brother. Perhaps I should help. Perhaps he thought of Exodus 23, verse 4. If thine enemy's ox or ass go astray, bring it to your enemy. What about if it's your brother? Think about the ox or the ass. What about if it's your brother that's fallen in need? You'd save his ox. You'd save your enemy's ox. Would you save your brother? But then, you know, there's going to be these practical considerations. The man needs a doctor. I'm not a doctor. And perhaps this is a trap. I mean, look where we are. We're on the ascent of blood. As soon as I stop, I'm at my safety. He can't help. He can't help. And so a third person comes. In verse 33, it says that a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now, what do you think the audience was expecting Jesus to say in verse 33? Verse 31, a priest. Verse 32, a Levite. And then Jesus says, a third person comes. What do you think the audience was expecting? Well, of course, they were expecting another Jew, weren't they? But a certain Samaritan comes in verse 33. Oh, look, you, could, you, you would have seen the alarm go through the crowd. Why? Because John 4 verse 9 says, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. If you ever wanted a definition of who your neighbor was, you'd never say a Samaritan. The Jews hated the Samaritans. So Jesus' choice is very specific in verse 33. There was no debate about the definition of a neighbor or an enemy. Samaritans were enemies. But there's something else in here. Look at verse 30. The certain man went down. Verse 31. The certain priest came that way. Verse 32. Likewise, a Levite. So you see in verse 30, 31, 32, the, uh, everyone's traveling the same direction. They're all going from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan journeyed. There's no direction in that. He's just journeying. And the implication seems to be that the Samaritan's going the other way. He's going from Jer uh, Jericho back up to Jerusalem. Well, what happens? Verse 34, <coughs> he went to this man. He bound up his wounds, he poured in oil and wine, he set him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, he gave them to the host, that is the innkeeper, he said to him, take care of him, and whatso whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. So you'd almost think the Samaritan was a doctor, wouldn't you? I mean, he's unduly prepared for the situation that he finds himself in, in verse 33. He's carrying wine, he's carrying oil, he's able to bind up somebody's wounds. He puts him on an ass, which means the Samaritan had to walk. He takes him to an inn in verse 34. He pays the cost, he clearly stays all the rest of the day, and look at this, look at verse 35, on the morrow. He doesn't just stay the rest of the day, he stays all night. <coughs> 
helping this man who he happened upon on the road. You've got to say, verse 35, on the morrow, the Samaritan leaves. If there's any more cost, let me know when I return and I'll pay the complete bill then. Well beyond the call of duty, you might say, looking after someone who was frankly just a stranger on the road. Well, before I explain all of that, let me show you something else, because there's something more to this than meets the eye. Do you know this whole story of the Good Samaritan is actually based on an Old Testament event? Come back with me to 2 Chronicles 28. In the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 28. It's the time of the <clears throat> divided kingdom of Israel and Judah. Israel in the north, under the rulership of Pekah. Judah in the south under the rulership of Ahaz. <clears throat> and in 2 Chronicles chapter 28, the northern kingdom of Israel attacked the southern kingdom of Judah. And it tells us in verse 6 that Pekah, the king of the north, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day, which were all valiant men, because they'd forsaken Yahweh God of their fathers. So the northern army of Jews attacks the southern kingdom under Ahaz. You read of Ahaz in verse 1 of this chapter. So, so Pekah's army attacks Ahaz's army and kills 120,000 people, all valiant men. And not only that, in verse 8 it says, And the children of Israel carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons, daughters, and they took away much spoil from them and brought the spoil to Samaria. So this is Jew against Jew. There are no Samaritans in the spoil. But the capital of the northern kingdom of Pekah was the city of Samaria. Well, what happens? They've just killed 120,000. They're taking 200,000 captives from the south up to the north. And on the way, it tells us in verse 19, an old prophet steps out in the road, the prophet Oded. And it says in verse 9 that there was a prophet of Yahweh there whose name was Oded. He went out before the host that came to Samaria and said to them, Behold, because Yahweh God of your fathers was wroth with Judah, he's delivered them to your hand. You've slain them in rage that reaches up to heaven. You are not taking captives. Well, of course, there was an enormous debate now between the rulers of Samaria and the army of Samaria. You read in verse 12 of the heads of the children of Ephraim. These are the leaders of the northern kingdom. And you read in verse 14 of the armed men. That's the army of the northern kingdom. And, and the debate here was that the leaders said, we should listen to Oded the prophet. And the army in verse 14 said, no, we shouldn't. We're the victors. We keep the spoil. Well, the result was that the leaders prevailed. And in verse 15, it says the men, that is the men of verse 12, who were named the leaders, the men which were expressed by name rose up. They took the captives and look at this. And with the spoil clothed all that were naked among them, arrayed them, shod them, gave them to eat and drink, anointed them, carried the feeble of them upon what? asses, brought them to where? Jericho, so took them back home down south to the city of palm trees, to their brethren, and they returned to where? To Samaria. This is the basis, it would seem, of the parable of the good Samaritan. And in this case, the named men of verse 12 acted like the Samaritans, but the armed men of verse 14 acted like the priests and the Levites. They couldn't and wouldn't help. Now, in this case, as I said, it's Jew against Jew. This is before the time when the Samaritans as a caste have been imported into the Northern Kingdom. But you see the parallels nevertheless with the story Jesus tells in Luke chapter 10. We'll come back with me to Luke 10. Because Jesus hasn't finished with this lawyer. 
We're down to the end of verse 35. We've heard the story, and now comes the burning question in verse 36 of Luke chapter 10. Jesus says, all right, he says, which of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritan, which of these three thinkest thou was neighbor to him that fell among thieves? And he said, that is the lawyer said, he that showed mercy on him. What do you think of that answer? If I said to you, which of these three thinkest thou was neighbor to him that fell among thieves, what would you say? What would be the first thing on the tip of your tongue? You'd say, the Samaritan. Look what he says in verse 37. He that showed mercy. He can't say it, can he? He can't say it. He can't say the word Samaritan. He hates him. He really hates him. And the Samaritans will be the last people that he had ever categorized as his neighbor. He's a lawyer. He can't spit the word out. He that showed mercy on him. Well, says Jesus, then you copy him. Go and do thou likewise. Well, the exhortation is very clear. Let me give you the, the first simple exhortation. And the exhortation, you might say, is to good works. Here's the quote, 1 John 3, verse 16. It's very clear. 1 John 3, verse 16 says this. Hereby perceive we love. Because Christ laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And, and G, oh, sorry, John adds to that just across the page in 1 John 4 verse 20. If a man says he loves God and hates his brother, he's a liar. How can you love your brother who you can see? Sorry, how can, how can you love who you can see? How can you love God who you can't? Okay, so it's pretty clear. Love has got to be practical. It can't just be big words. And particularly, if you have the means to solve a problem, your means are provided to you by God. You should use those means to solve the problem. But you might look at this and say, ah, but be careful. 1 John 3 is talking about loving your brother. The power of the Good Samaritan is talking about loving your neighbor. It's different. Is it? Is it? How do you know if you love God? And the answer is, you love God. If you love the things God loves. Well, Leviticus 19 verse 18 said, love your neighbor. That's what the lawyer quoted. But Leviticus 19, the same chapter, Leviticus 19 and verse 34 says, the stranger that dwelleth among you shall be as one of you. You shall love him as yourself. You love the neighbor and you love the stranger. You see? So it's not good enough just to say, oh, well, who's my brother? If you've got the means, use the means that God's provided. There's another very good quote on this. Proverbs 19 and verse 17. And you read this quote, and well, I'm not going to add anything to this because it speaks for itself, and it's eminently powerful by itself. It says this in Proverbs 19 and verse 17. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto Yahweh, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. Well, what would you add to that? You're lending to the poor. God says, I will repay you. Now, I'm not saying from that, by the way, that we should open soup kitchens. Our priorities are the brotherhood. It's very clear, the household of faith before the rest of the world. The point is, however, if you have the means, you should use it. 
And Proverbs 19 verse 17 says, and when you do use it, you're lending to God and God will pay you back. But now come back to Luke 10 because we have a problem. Do you remember the question that the Lord asked in Luke 10 and verse 36? Look at it again. Luke 10 verse 36, Jesus said to the lawyer, <clears throat> Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor to him that fell among thieves? So which one was the neighbor? That is, which of those three had compassion? Very easy question to understand. The problem is this. That's not the question the lawyer asked. Look at verse 29. You see, the lawyer willing to justify himself said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? That is not what Jesus answered in verse 36. Do you see the contrast? In verse 29, the question was, who is my neighbor? That is, who should I love? Who should I care for? The answer comes back in verse 36 from Jesus. He says, who was neighborly? Who did the loving? Who did the caring? You see what's happened? Jesus has changed the question. By the time we get to the end of the parable, it's not a question of, of how we should treat people, but how we would want them to treat us. So if we were on the ground in critical condition, half dead, how would you want people to define who their neighbor was? <laughs> well, you'd, you'd want them to take the widest possible definition of who their neighbor was because you've got a need. And when, we're, and when we're in need, we want everybody to be neighborly. Of course we would. Now, why has Jesus done this? You can see what he's done in verse 36. He's flipped the whole question around 180 degrees. Why has he done it? Well, he has done it because of the real meaning of the parable. Because you see, this is precisely the situation we find ourselves in. I'm going to say the lawyer doesn't know it. But he's lying on the road, bleeding to death. He doesn't know it. Now look at the parable again, verse 30. Verse 30, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was the steepest road in Israel. It was the passage of blood ending up in the cursed city. This is the passage of life. This is the way of blood. Jeruz Jericho is death. Achan thought he could escape the condemnation of the city of Jericho. He's attracting the So this is the passage of life from life to death. And we're on that road, all of us. And there are problems on that road. Hebrews 12 verse 1 talks about sin that so easily besets us. That's the thieves. In fact, it says in verse 30 that this man, this traveling man, fell among thieves. James 1 verse 2. We fall into diverse temptations. And so there we are on the road, brothers and sisters. Not dead, but dying. And in walk a priest and a Levite, the preeminent representatives of the law. But the problem was that the law couldn't save. The law of Moses couldn't give you salvation. Romans 3 verse 20. By the works of the law shall no man be justified. Because by the law is the knowledge of sin. It's, the law will give you the knowledge of sin not the solution to sin. It could only identify problems. Romans 8 verse 3, what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sent his own son to do, to condemn sin. The law couldn't do anything for you. And therefore a priest or a Levite can't help you when you're, when you're on the road half dead. But then comes a Samaritan. Then comes a Samaritan. He's going in the other direction. And not only that, you look at it again closely at verse 31. The priest passed by on the other side. The Levite, verse 32, passed by on the other side. But, verse 33, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. He came where he was. Hebrews 2, verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Jesus Christ 
became where we are. He fully identified with us. Hebrews 5 verse 2, we have an high priest who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, because he himself also was compassed with infirmity. He's come where we are. He didn't pass by on the other side. And do you know what the religious leaders thought of the Lord Jesus Christ? John 8. John 8. He's in debate with the religious leaders of his day. Jesus answered them in John 8, verse 34. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. I know that you're Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. They answered and said to him, oh, they said, Abraham's our father. Jesus said to him, well, if you were Abraham's children, you do the works of Abraham. You're nothing like Abraham. He that is of God heareth God's words. You don't hear them because you're not of God, he says. Then answered the Jews and said to him, ah, say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? And that's it, isn't it? That's it. The Lord Jesus Christ is the good Samaritan. They were right for the wrong reasons, but they were right. He is the good Samaritan. Now think about what's happening here. Why is the Samaritan so prepared, so prepared to deal with critically ill people? The Samaritan in verse 34 looked after this, this unfortunate man. He's got oil and wine. They represent the gospel in Isaiah 55 and verse 1. He took him to an inn. That inn represents the ecclesia. Do you know, here's a quote for you. Matthew 24 and verse 45. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom the Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Do you know what the word household is? The Greek word for household in Matthew 24 verse 45. It's the Greek word therapeia from which we get the English word therapy. The household is an ecclesia. And an ecclesia is a hospital. So that you see that in the real meaning of this parable, when this man woke up the next morning, when this wounded man woke up the next morning, he found himself in a bed surrounded by other beds of sick people. All of them rescued on previous journeys to the Samaritan, dragged out of the world, all in critical condition, all brought together into an ecclesia. So you put it together. What's really happening in the parable of the Good Samaritan? The Samaritan happens upon this traveler. He's extremely prepared to find travelers. He's got bandages. He's got wine. He's got oil. He takes him to an inn where he's been before and to where he expects to return. He drops whatever he's got and takes care of this man. You know what the Samaritan's doing? He's going up and down this road, looking for sick people. And not just this road, every highway and byway, looking for sick people to take to that inn. And in verse 35, it says that he took out some money and he paid a price. He paid the price, two pence. The Greek is two denarius. Commentators tell us that in the Jewish currency, that money was the exact equivalent of the half shekel of the sanctuary of Exodus 30 and verse 15, which was the price of redemption. And if that's not enough, the Samaritan says in verse 35, if there's any further cost, when I come again, I'll repay thee. What does that tell you? The Samaritan's going to return, isn't he? The Samaritan is going to return. And that lawyer, that lawyer thought he had everything under control. He thought people needed him. But his time was so limited, he had to divide it carefully amongst people who, who, who really were his neighbors. And he's going to have to make a decision about who he helps. But the fact is, he can't help anyone. He is desperately ill himself. He's at the point of death. And what could the Samaritan do for that lawyer? The answer is, not much. Why? 
because Matthew 9 and verse 32 says, Jesus says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I can only help people who think they need help. Luke 5 verse 31, those that are whole need not a physician. Now, the lawyer wasn't whole at all. He was critically ill, but he thought he was whole. So he was never going to take himself to a doctor. He would never find himself in an ecclesia. And you see, this is the problem. It's very easy to think we don't need anything when, in fact, the opposite's true. We are critically ill, each of us. But here's the interesting thing. You've just seen this parable interpreted at two levels. At the simple level, as an excitation to good works. At a more detailed level, as an exhortation to ecclesial life and the need that we have and the, and, and the Lord Jesus Christ as the good Samaritan. So let's call the first one the exhortation to service. Do good to those in need, especially if you've got the means to do so. It's very simple to understand. And then the next level, an exhortation about salvation. Christ is the Samaritan who saves us from certain death. That's equally clear. But here's the third one. There was a time when the Lord Jesus Christ himself became a wounded man. He was crucified and fell among two thieves. They stripped him of his raiment. They wounded him and they left him hard dead. And he would not, without divine assistance, would not make it to the end of the day. Well, he didn't. Did he? And on the cross, priests and Levites pass by and wag their heads. The chief priests mocked him. But when he needed it most, there was a Samaritan for him too. Joseph and Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, took him from the cross bound him with bandages, took him to a tomb, paid the full price and buried him there and planned to return the next opportunity. Joseph of Arimathea, what's more, was on the Sanhedrin. Nicodemus was on the Sanhedrin. <coughs> the very place where the Lord's words up until that point in time had made no impression whatsoever. And so now we have three levels of interpretation. And what began, you see, is a very simple parable. In fact, becomes a parable of life. And even the Lord Jesus Christ finds his application in this parable. Why? Well, because for the simple reason of verse 33, he came where he was. He too understands what it's like to be half dead lying on a road in desperate need of assistance. And so a simple parable, brothers and sisters, but in fact, a very, very powerful parable. And the application to us, as I think you can see, is very clear.